Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Joe Arnold, and I'm the CEO of SwiftStack. Um, and today we're going to talk about global clusters in Swift. And what global clusters is, is the ability to replicate data to multiple sites, uh, multiple data centers, wherever they happen to be. Um, and this morning, we got to see uh, Concur on stage talk about their use of global clusters. And what they're doing is they have two data centers. And in each one of those data centers, they have copies of their data going into whichever data center is closest to where their customers are. And what Swift, do, Swift does is it replicates the data between those two data centers, so it's, it's available. Now, they have a use case where they're trying to scale up to tens of billions of, of images, um, and that's what it was architected uh, to do. But more to the point, it's really not about disaster recovery. It's about providing a better experience for the customers. Because by having the content closer to where that customer is, they're able to upload faster. They're able to download that content faster. Um, and in the case of an emergency, they're able to flop over to the other data center and, and keep right on going. So kind of a picture of how this, uh, this works. We have, so let's say we have a, we're going to configure this. We're actually going to walk through this right now between uh, Portland and Hong Kong. If you're dragging some content over to, uh, say, you're using the application, what happens is if you incorporate something like a, a global load balancing, then that request will be routed to a nearby location. So there's many DNS servers, services that provide this, and so you take advantage of that. It gets written with full durability in a single location. We call this affinity write. And then asynchronously, that data gets replicated to another location. If another user comes along and say they're in a different part of the world, or a different, uh, then they can load that content. Picture of a cat. And also using GeoDNS, they get routed to a nearby data center, and they'll pull, pull, that, pull that up. So that's kind of roughly how it works. And the technology that we provide is, uh, well, one, we've been part of the development of, so our company is SwiftStack. And what we do is we provide a, a deployment platform, management platform around OpenStack Swift. But not just that, we also have people on the core Swift team who help build a lot of the features that are in Swift. Um, and global clusters is, is one of them. And so what we have is a, uh, is a product, and there's, really, there's two parts to it. Uh, one part is this something that we call the SwiftStack nodes. And the SwiftStack nodes includes OpenStack Swift. It includes management, monitoring information, and all that whole runtime stack needed to get that environment up and running. I actually have a lot of authentication components in there, um, um, everything you need. Then there's the SwiftStack controller. And what the controller does is it allows you to manage, deploy, scale, and configure an environment. So you can do things like rolling upgrades, um, uh, configure user accounts, we collect usage information, things like, things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through setting this thing up. So right now we have a, we have a web client. Um, and what I'm going to do is just demonstrate this. So I actually have this infrastructure running right now. And I'm uploading some of that content. This is just a web interface to, that, that you can use. You can skin this for your, for your own purposes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I feel like Julia Child. I've already done a node installation. And what happens is this node will connect to the SwiftStack controller. And when it makes that connection, it registers itself. And we can go through the process of claiming that and adding that new node to a cluster. So I have this URL here that it created for me when I uh, did the installation commands. And by the way, this installs on uh, Ubuntu. It installs on uh, CentOS. It installs on, on Red Hat as well. Let's see. OK. So let's paste that guy in here. And I get this claiming, claiming process. And so it's going to start establishing a connection between the 
that node and the controller. So we got a VPN session between the two. Again, the controller doesn't reach out to the node. The node reaches out to whatever controller that it's using. And uh, so I'm going to go through that claiming process and add it to a cluster. So I'm going to go to demo 10. I already have two nodes running in this environment. Um, and I'm going to ingest this new one. I'm going to say, drop this into the Hong Kong node. And I actually have a load balancer set up between the two. And on each node, there's a health check URL, which will add it in or remove it, um, depending if it responds to the health check or not. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to configure this guy. Um, one of the neat things is you can actually specify a separate replication network for global clusters. And I mean, we just acknowledge that that WAN link is going to be an expensive uh, two between your two sites. And so if you want to do things like throttle that network differently, then you can just set that different network, uh, network uh, right here. We're going to manage the drives. And what this means is we're just going to format these, that, format these guys, and it will go through the process of um, taking each drive that's on that node. We'll label it. We'll format it inventory it so that way when drives float around the data center, which they do, when you plug that back in, node back into the system, it knows what to do with it. Now I'm going to add this node, this capacity into the cluster. And we actually have two options here. One is, one is called gradual addition, one's immediate addition. And we also have the same concept when you're adding a new geographic region. Because one thing is, when you, when you add a new region into your, into your storage system, you don't want to instantaneously replicate everything all at the same time. And you will just saturate network connections. Users won't be able to access the storage system. So what we do is we throttle that by doing things in an incremental way. And we do that both when we add new devices into the cluster, and also when we add replicas or add uh, geographies, uh, different regions into the cluster, so we can do it in a smooth way. So I'm just going to do now, change. All right, so now I'm going to enable the node in the cluster and deploy changes. It's telling me to do that. I'm adding this node and I'm deploying the config to the cluster. And so now what it's doing is it's building a ring and then it's going to push the ring out to all those devices. And we wait. I can tell you more anyway. Uh, so here's where you configure it. Uh, so we have the regions. So I just configured a couple in here. So you have the, we have our Portland region, Hong Kong region. Um, we have some middleware that can be configured. Um, one of our real popular ones that we have is an, an active directory an LDAP integration. Oops, this one here. And what this does is, if you have an LDAP system already set up in your environment, it will connect back into that and allow you to, instead of having to create a, a user per, uh, on the, dedicated on the storage system, we can just connect into the Active Directory LDAP system, and you don't need to provision any additional user accounts. So it's just a, it's a nice management tool. Um, to have on there. And the reason why this takes so long is because we're doing a lot of math. We're actually um, building this stru data structure in the ring which does the data placement. Because we have this data placement strategy called as unique as possible. And what it does is if you have one node and you have a bunch of drives in that node, it'll place the data across each one of those drives. If you start adding more nodes, like two nodes, three nodes, four nodes, then it will distribute that, the, the, the replicas across all, of the avail all that available ca capacity. You start moving outside of the data center into regions, then, uh, or into zones, and then into regions, it'll also distribute those data across. And, and that way you get availability for the data, um, and if catastrophe strikes in one of those locations, then you're protected from uh, the, the failure there. So, ah, okay, it finished. So I'm going to go open that web console again. And I have my, my data here. Let me go create another one, another container. All right, I got my fresh container. And I'm going to 
um, upload more data onto my cluster with more capacity. As soon as the load balancer figures out that that new capacity is there, it's been configured to pull in that, that extra capacity into the environment. And now I have a bigger cluster and more regions to put my data in. So that's the functionality of global clusters. Oh, Mari has another thing. So at our booth, we have this, uh, we've been working with, um, um, on a new drive format, if you want to go to our booth and check it out, it's, um, it's a drive with an Ethernet jack on it. Um, it's been produced by Seagate, and we've uh, written OpenStack Swift code to be compatible with uh, this new drive format. It is actually an Ethernet drive. You plug it in uh, into a switch, and it gets an IP address, and then you communicate over it with keys and values. It's, 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 a, it's a, just a completely uh, revolutionary, no pun intended, uh, way to store uh, device data into a device. Um, so please, our booth is uh, right over by the entrance on the, on the left-hand side. And I'm getting queued here. All right, so then uh, we have a session on uh, this afternoon where we're talking about uh, software-defined storage with OpenStack. And that will be over by the hotel at 340. We will have a book on software-defined storage with OpenStack Swift, which will be available at our booth after 2 o'clock today, we hope. 3 o'clock, just to be sure. And then, which side? All right. Then the case study, then we have the workshop on deploying OpenStack Swift on Thursday at 4.30, where everyone, show up with your laptop, and we're going to go through the process of doing the configuration, doing the deployment, setting things up, failing the environment, and we're going to do it in a rapid fire succession. We're actually going to set up raw vanilla Swift and go through that, and then we're going to go through and set up uh, Swift Stack and go through that. So we get our hands dirty on a bunch of different stuff on Thursday afternoon at 4.30. Again, that'll be right across the street from the hotel. Mario, is there anything else I should add? You've been prompting me and queuing me here. This is a phenomenal thing. Like, uh, come, do come check it out. I'll be here for a few more minutes. Um, um, and happy to answer any questions we have about um, Swift and Swift Stack. And there's my new cluster in the environment, ready to go. Thanks for listening. Have a good day. <laughs>